welcome. You're plugged into Rooted Digital, that is Rooted Fellowship's online community platform, and we're delighted to have you this morning. My name is Pinky Mukwena, and I have the privilege of hosting you this morning and just navigating the session and, and just the church service together. We're really excited. It's an exciting season full of blessing and we're here for that. Um, we always say that Rooted Fellowship is about three things and these three things are core to who we are. That is that we are gospel-centered, we are disciple-making and we are transcultural. If you'd like to hear more about what these all are about, head over to our website will you at rootedfellowship.com and you can double click on every single one of them that you'd like and you will find as much information as you need to. We always say also that we're a very generous church. We give because much has been given to us, right? And so if you'd like to be a part of giving at Rooted Fellowship, we invite you, bring on the giving, <laughs> bring on the generosity. Um, you can do so by heading on over to our website as well. There's information on how you can give um, to the church and to, to ministry in, in general. Um, but also if you have a need and if you need assistance in this time in any way, please feel free to reach out to the community at rootedfellowship.com on email. Um, let the brothers and sisters know what your need is and we will be sure to, to reach out to you in whatever way we can. So we're in a new series, right? We're in a new season, Advent, it's exciting. We're pausing and reflecting on, on what God has done through Jesus and sending God to earth. That was remarkable. I recently read a book that you never read of a story where Shakespeare meets Hamlet unless if Shakespeare himself orchestrates the meeting. And in this case, God did that. He orchestrated our meeting him through sending Jesus to earth. So it's a really exciting season. I invite you to relax if you have a cup of coffee or water. Sit back, relax, we'll worship together. Do not forget to engage with us and interact with us by liking. On it always says smash the like button, smash the subscribe and smash that share button. But other than that, we'll see you on the flip side. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune thy heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I hold by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood oh to raise our greater debt daily i'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wonder lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love here's my heart oh take it seal it seal it for thy gods above 
Here's my heart, oh, take it, seal it, seal it for thy court above. Advent. Of all the seasons in the church calendar, Advent probably feels the most familiar. As Christians, Advent helps us deconstruct and deny the unhelpful stories that we find ourselves caught up in, especially those connected to our culture's concept of Christmas, which is oftentimes filled with individualism and consumerism. Instead, we get to reconstruct and embrace the true story of the gospel in our lives. We recognize the weight of sin and brokenness personally, corporately and cosmically, and we see with clear eyes our need for Jesus. Advent shows us how the light of the birth of Christ appeared against a backdrop of darkness, depravity and despair. This is why our Advent theme for 2020 is one of King Jesus breaking into the darkness, despair, chaos and brokenness. We cannot rush to celebrate the arrival of Jesus without staring the darkness and despair that he comes to heal us from in the face. 2020 has been a hard year for all of us and Advent helps us to take stock of that and also helps lead us to celebrate the eternal hope that we have in the arrival of King Jesus to usher in a new kingdom. We will be drawing these themes of darkness, despair, chaos and brokenness from the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms has been described as the anatomy of the soul because it represents all of our human emotions. It is honest and yet redemptive. We pray that the Advent series will be a blessing to all our Rooted Fellowship family. Tis the season. Blessings. Good morning, Nimacheloni. Uh, welcome to Rooted. My name is Kenny and I have the lovely a privilege of serving uh, here in Rooted as one of the elders. And this morning I have the lovely privilege of actually unpacking God's Word. So if you've been tracking with us, uh, you will know that last week we entered uh, the season of Advent. So Pastor One uh, started us off uh, with uh, just one of the themes that's that exists with the, within the human experience, and that was the theme of darkness to light. And so this morning, I'm going to explore uh, the theme of despair to hope. And so in, co in continuing our walk through Advent, we are going to be moving through the theme of despair and hope, two things that are so interwoven into the fabric of our being, it is impossible to speak about the one without speaking about the other, especially from a biblical standpoint. Despair is that feeling of hopelessness, powerlessness, sorrow, defeat, distress. In a world that is plagued by brokenness, selfish gain, structural inequalities, uh, subjective morality, despair is imminent. We cannot run away from it. Uh, black, white, colored, Indian, Asian, rich or poor. It visits us. And so Jesus told his disciples, in this world you will have sorrow, but take heart I have overcome the world. Enter hope. And so hope is that thing that it has kept civilizations going. It has destroyed empires. It has created new generations. Uh, we've made movies based on hope. We have written books. There's a whole coffee cup industry that is based on putting the word hope on a mug. And it's profitable. And so hope is that feeling of expectation, of anticipation, the feeling of trust that something will happen and often in our favor. Hope is a powerful thing in the human psyche. I love what Tim Mackey says, uh, and listen carefully. He says, what you hope for shapes what you live for. I didn't go as far as to say I'm not Tim Mackey, but that what you hope for even has the power and potential to shape uh, communities and generations. So our base foundation in exploring uh, this theme of despair and hope 
will be Psalm 142. This was David's prayer while he was in the cave. At that stage, uh, David had become the, was the anointed king, but it hadn't panned out as one would expect. Instead, Saul, who was the first king, was after him trying to take his life. And so what we get to see, what we get to witness is uh, in writing, uh, David's transition from feelings of isolation, abandonment, hopelessness, powerlessness, sorrow, distress, the list goes on, to uh, confident trust. Put simply, we get to witness his transition from momentary um, despair to eternal hope. Most of us here may be able to relate to this because right now we may be feeling like we are in a cave, although not a literal cave, but a cave of despair. And so turn with me to Psalm 142 uh, as we as you read the scripture. Um, you are more than welcome to just also listen, uh, listen through the screen. Psalm 142. I cry to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him. I tell him all my troubles. When I'm overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Then I pray to you, O oh Lord. I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd me, for you are good to me. That's a good word. Uh, join me in prayer. Lord, uh, we... We want to acknowledge you. We want to acknowledge that you are a good God. You are an amazing God. We want to acknowledge uh, the fact that you do care, Lord. And even in the midst of despair, in the midst of um, trying times, Lord, you are there in the midst of all of that. And so um, use me as a vessel. Um, speak through me. Uh, I pray that each and every word may be uh, seasoned with hope, seasoned with your goodness, Lord. Uh, and to those whose hearts are failing, to those whose hearts are uh, in a moment of brokenness, for those who can't take one step further into this life, Lord, I pray that this is um, this brings new energy, new encouragement. And for those that don't know you, Lord, I pray that people may see you like they've never seen you uh, through this message, Lord. We want to thank you. We want to praise you. Uh, we love you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to unpack how David transitions from despair to hope in four parts. So it's my plea, my plight. And this is almost, you could almost say this is part one. This is where uh, David gives his hard truth. And then the second part is the hope, the transformation. And this is where David goes through his transition, right? And so the hope is that after this, we'll be able to just witness this happening. And this will be an encouragement for us in whatever space that we're in or whatever the future space of despair uh, we're going to enter into. And so part one, my plea. As obvious as it may sound, the first thing to do in moments of despair is to turn to God and direct our pleas to him. David opens his prayers with pleas to God in verse 1 and verse 2. Let's read it. I cried to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I poured my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. And so like I mentioned previously, this sounds like something that's very obvious. This sounds like a, a go-to that when we are in moments of despair, the first place we'll go to is God. But more, more often than not, that is not the case. If you listen to Pastor Honor's message last week on darkness to light, he touched on this. And you'll remember that he said that God lamented at Israel, his chosen nation, his children, um, that they do not cry to him in their torment, but would rather seek help 
elsewhere. And as you read in Hosea 7.14, it says, They do not cry to me with sincere hearts. Instead, they sit on their couches and wail. They cut themselves, begging for foreign gods, begging foreign gods for grain and new wine. And they turn away from me. And so we may sit there and think, um, that's not me. I'm not turning to foreign gods for help. And in all, in all honesty, uh, there may be many reasons why we don't direct our pleas to God. But one of the reasons is just the fact that we often have our own functional saviors. The things that we have control over, the things that we turn to instead of God. And although they don't sound as threatening as foreign gods, uh, these are the idols in our lives that we turn to. We turn to the plan A, B, C, D, right down the alphabet to Z. And we run out of letters, we run out of plans, and then we circle back to God where we should have started. And at times we do not direct our pleas to God because we have actively chosen to turn away from God. And maybe this is because we are angry, maybe things did not work out uh, as they should have. And we turn away from God, whether it's we stop reading the Bible, we stop going to church, we stop engaging in community. But what we're saying is that, God, I will not direct my pleas to you because you have not done things the way that I expected. And for some of us, we are in that space where we haven't turned to God in a long time. Uh, It's been quite a while since we've been in fellowship with God. And we are wondering, man, well, can I still turn to God? Will God listen to me? And 2020 has been that kind of a year that has just thrown everything into a tailspin. It has made us realize that we are hopeless. Uh, We need something outside of ourselves. And so whatever the reason, whatever the reason you're not directing your pleas to God, you're not turning to Him, I want to encourage you, I want to tell you, I want to affirm you that God actually wants you to approach Him with your pleas and complaints. He will not be overwhelmed. God is not a therapist who is from eight to five, who has certain slots. God is there saying that bring your pleas, bring your complaints. I love, I love what David says in, um, in verse two. He says, I, pour my, I poured my complaints before him. This idea of before him also translates right in his face. Right? This, is, this is a show of intimacy that, I'm, that David is being direct. And so when we turn to him, it helps us to also acknowledge that we have reached the end of ourselves. It helps us to recognize our insufficiency. And in that same space as well, it also results in worship for us. Because while acknowledging our insufficiency, at the same time, we are declaring that God cares, God hears, God acts, God knows best, he can be trusted And God is all-powerful. And this is perfectly summed up in verse 3 where David says, When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Family, this is where David's insufficiency collides with God's sovereignty and omniscience. God's sovereignty and omniscience is just a fancy of saying that God is all-powerful. And God is all-knowing. And in that, and in that collision, only one person wins, and that's God. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. And so family, hopelessness and despair, they're one of the very few human experiences that cause us to seek God in his rightful place. His rightful place as the sovereign as the, as the one who has absolute dominion on everything that is and everything that isn't. More often than not, when we're not, we're not in moments of despair or hopelessness, we approach God as an option. We approach God as something that when I feel like it, I will, I will go to him. But in these desperate moments, we recognize God for who he is. And this, goes, this, this happens on both sides of the spectrum. This is for the person that is approaching God angry 
saying, God, why have you not done things the way that I want you to do, that I want you to do? This goes the same for the person that is desperate and saying, God, I need you to do something. On both sides of the spectrum, these people are declaring that God is all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and God can do, can do things. And often he does. Let's shift to part two, my plight. So family, as we go to verse three, 3b, the, the second part of verse three and of verse four, we see that David with raw emotion details his circumstances to God. He says, wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. And most of us are feeling like, man, this, this has been my 2020. I feel isolated. I feel abandoned. No one is coming. Everyone that I, could, that I can turn to, that I could turn to, is probably in the same space as me. And so family, we can pretend with everyone else and get it spot on, but not with God. We're not helping God uh, when we tell him um, euphemistic truths. God isn't looking for our pretense, but rather God wants our honesty grounded in a posture of, um, a posture of worship. And so for us, we shouldn't be, when we approach God, we shouldn't be in that state of, I'm kind of fine, um, I'm good, um, I'm in trouble, but I think I'll be fine. God knows everything. And, the, and as I mentioned before, God actually wants us to approach him. And so this is what happens when, when we express these truths, when you tell God about our plight. It brings us to a state of, of being humble. It brings us to a state of acknowledging and reminding us of two things. That one, we are powerless to change our circumstances. My networks, my competence, my accolades, my titles, my wealth at a certain point in time will be an effective currency to change my circumstances. And then number two, we live in a broken world with broken systems and that needs something outside of itself to fix it. And so there may be some of you here that are saying that I have wept, Kenny. I have poured my heart out. I have shared my plight with him. I have acknowledged my insufficiency and nothing has changed. Or in actual fact, things escalated and things got worse. And man, I feel you. I feel you. And you might be saying, man, even, even in all those moments, I've done everything. I've turned to him. But God has done nothing. God is doing nothing, and it looks like he will do nothing. And to that I say, look to the story of Advent. God sends his one and only son to live the life that none of us could live. Isaiah 53.3 states that he was despised, he was rejected, acquainted with grief, in order that we might attain the hope of eternal life. The story of Advent is evidence that our despair matters to God. Our plight matters to God. And so for most of us in hearing this, I'm hoping that it's an encouragement. I'm hoping that in this we get to anchor ourselves in God and realizing that God does care. God acts and God has done something. And so for most of us, I hope that this is a, this is a turning point in the spaces that we're in as we meditate on this. So as we move to part three, we move to verse five and six. And so verse five and six, uh, part three is hope. And so verse five and six reads as, then I pray to you, O Lord, I say you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Hear my cry. For I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. So verse 5 and 6, we see that through the use of repetition, 
uh, we see David, David's turning point in his moment of despair. And so verse 1, when we track back to verse 1, uh, David begins his, saw, his psalm, his prayer with, I pray to you, Lord. And everything that follows after that is a man in distress. This is a man that all of us can say, man, I, I'm in David's shoes. This literally sounds my, my prayer every night, every day. These sound like the words that I've captured, that I've captured in my journal. All right. And verse 5 begins exactly the same. I pray to you, Lord. But what follows after that is significantly different. What follows after that is what sets, up, sets us apart as Christians from the rest of the world. What follows after that um, is, is, a, is a man that is anchored in God. What follows after that, we get to see a hope that is not like the world's hope. Right. So we're going to explore this um, in two points. So first point. David declares that God is his refuge while still being in a cave. And there is a lot of irony in that. There is a lot of irony in that. This is meaningful because what David is saying is that even though my situation has not changed, God is still his safe place. God is still his place of protection. God is his place of true salvation. That while being in the cave, it doesn't matter anymore as long as he's in God's refuge. And so we see that a lot of what David is going through hasn't changed, right? When we, when we go down to verse 6, it almost feels like more of the same. He says, hear my cry for I'm very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. And this just sounds like repetition. But the truth of the matter is, this time around, David is laying this complaint, this request before God with a different posture. He's laying this saying that, you know what, um, even though I'm anchored in who God is, even though God is my true salvation, I'm still going through stuff. I do still need rescuing from my circumstances, but my circumstances right now are not ultimate because what is ultimate is that I have found my hope in God. And so for most of us, this is a very, very difficult pill to swallow. That our hope should not ultimately be anchored in our circumstances changing, but in an unchanging God who sent his son to secure a priceless hope for eternal life. I love Peter's words here in 1 Peter 1 uh, verse 3 and I'll be reading from verse 3 to 7. And it's quite a, it's quite a, it's, these are very, very encouraging words. Uh, I encourage you if you have time to meditate on this, but this is what Peter says about eternal hope. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. Church, I hope that resonates with us. This is, what we're, this is, this is why we're anchored in Christ. This is the hope that awaits us. Verse 5 says, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And so I'll continue actually right to the end. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. And so in summary, what, what Peter is saying is that we have an eternal hope. We have a hope that is not based on our circumstances changing in this world. We have a hope that has been secured by the work of Christ through his resurrection. And this hope is a great hope. This is the hope that we get to be with God. We get to be in union with him in a world 
that is not under despair, that is not under oppressive systems, in a world that has been redeemed, and that is our hope. And so the second point to that so in, declare, in, in, in addition to declaring that God is his refuge, his safe place, David adds to that, you're all I want in life. This is very important. This is very, very important. God cannot be our salvation while he isn't all we want in life. God cannot be our salvation while he isn't all we want in life. In life. When we reach this point, we risk using God as a renter savior. We bring him in as and when we want to and put him back on the shelf when we think we no longer need him. This is very dangerous because we end up missing out on an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. But also because if our personal circumstances do not change, we may doubt God for who he says he is and miss out on something greater. And as we go through the scriptures, we see this especially happening at the coming of Jesus Christ, at the coming of the Messiah, that the Jews expected the Messiah to come and change their personal circumstances. And their personal circumstances were dire, church. They were very dire. They expected Jesus to essentially take over. They expected Jesus to, um, to root out uh, the oppressive and um, really, really brutal Roman regime to recreate a new kingdom for the Jews. And in all honesty, um, that didn't change. That didn't change. And because that didn't change, the personal circumstances didn't change. Uh, Jesus did not, did not root out the Roman Empire. They dismissed him as a savior. And they missed Jesus and they missed the real savior. They missed that Jesus did not actually come to deal with their personal circumstances first and foremost. But Jesus came to deal with a greater enemy. And that enemy is sin and death. And he conquered sin and death. And so the risk of um, looking at Jesus as one who just comes to deal with my, with my personal circumstances is that we risk, we risk seeing, not seeing the bigger picture of what Jesus is actually doing. And that is to ransom us from a very dark world. So as we recap on those two long points, when despair sets in and we're feeling weighed down by circumstances, our hope shouldn't be anchored in our circumstances changing, but rather than that Jesus came and overcame the world. And so as we anchor ourselves in the work of Jesus, our focus shifts. We shift from, from the cave to Calvary. We shift from hope, uh, for, excuse me, from despair to hope. And we even shift from me-centered to him and to us centered. And this is very important. And we see this transformation happening in verse seven. So come with me to verse seven as we land this. And so verse seven reads at, reads as, bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me for you are good to me. And so what we see here is that a lot of the focus has changed from just focusing on personal circumstances. David switches from rescue me because I need rescuing, which is important. It is important. But David has found greater meaning and instead of rescue me because I need rescuing, but he says, rather rescue me so that I may give you praise, Lord. Rescue me so that I may give you thanks. And so see, in the process of giving praise and bearing witness to that God is good, this attracts people. This brings people closer to us. This brings our church community closer because everyone is curious. Man, there's, there's something about you. And we, and we know these people. We know these people around us. It's the people 
with a story. It's the people that have gone through things. It's the people um, whose stories show just God constantly moving. It's those people with a story of hope. It's those people when, when we leave a conversation from a conversation with them, we feel encouraged. We, need, we, fo- we find a new sense of strength. We say, man, God has been working in their life. Man, I, I want some of that. I want that kind of hope. There's, there's a certain aroma or there's a certain aroma about them. I always feel refreshed and encouraged after a conversation with them. And so this is what this is what happens to David, and this is what he wants, and he says, The godly will, will crowd around me, for you are good to me. I can almost imagine David is there and people, everyone is clamoring to hear the story of how, how did God do this? What happened? What what we experience is, right? And all he can say is that God is good. God is my refuge. God is my true salvation. God is my hope. And I pray that that is our, that is our story, that this is our narrative, that we shift from me-centered. We shift from God Remove me from my circumstances because maybe I want a better life or a comfortable life. And I, I've been in those spaces. I've been in those spaces where things are really tough and all you just want to do is just move from that space and just move to a space where you don't have to be strong. I've prayed the prayers of just two words. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. But in all that, the moments where we said, you know what, God, we, we are fired with the remaining in this space. But take us out of this space so that we may give you praise. That when we tell this story, um, there's renewed hope in people's lives when they hear the stories. And so in wrapping this up, you may be asking, where to from here? Um, what, what can I do with this, Kenny? And I have to be honest, this, this isn't linear. Even though it's presented in a linear way, this isn't linear. Despair and hope are not linear. Right? And so it will look different for different people. For some, it may feel, it may feel like a light bulb moment. It's just an overnight thing. They read a scripture, they hear a story, and it just, it just hits. And they're in. They anchor themselves in the hope of eternal life. For some, it's a crawl. It's a very long, painful crawl, but they're still in it. And for some, it's a daily exercise. It's a daily exercise of reminding themselves that Christ is the true hope. God provides the true salvation. God provides the true hope. And there will be days of unbelief knocking on the door and it's scary but in all of that my prayer is that we are anchored in the truth and reality of that Jesus came and Jesus coming was God responding to our despair Jesus coming uh, was it him just coming but it was him acting decisively against sin and death and every other thing that belongs to a broken world, throw in their despair, sorrow, distress. And he dealt with them decisively. And so my hope in all of this is that as we hear this, this causes a transformation. This causes us not to focus too much on our circumstances, although very real. But in all of that, we're able to take our pleas before God and say, God, I need your mercy. I need your grace. In that space, we also need to be able to share our plight with him. We need to be able to go to him and say, Abba, Father, this is what is happening. These are the details, and I have no hope. But in all of that, as we settle in, we do that in light of that Jesus came. Jesus overcame the world, and he is coming again. So that is my hope for all of us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we want to thank you that um, you did come, you did respond. 
and you did act and you acted decisively and the fact that you acting you you coming this is something that never has to be done again that our hope has been secured that our hope is unchanging that our hope is priceless that everything that is happening everything that is not working out as it should considering the kind of year that we've had lord that you're in the midst of this you're in the midst of giving hope to hopeless people you're in the you're in the you're in the business of restoring what has been broken what has been lost so lord our cry is that you hear us hear our cry hear our hearts and so lord uh, be with us in a way that is so obvious continues to remind us lord that this is a broken world but you are broken on our behalf lord and that we can safely anchor ourselves in you and we can trust you so lord we want to thank you we want to praise you in your holy name we pray amen thank you <laughs>